Yeah, thanks very much for inviting me. Um, thanks to Peter Salvi for funding this whole programme of uh, scholarship. I'm going to talk about crisis policymaking, um, and I'm going to critique it through the lens of pragmatist philosophy. Uh, and I'm going to start by acknowledging the input of people who know more about this topic than I do. So I'd like to thank Professors Cheryl Missack from the University of Toronto and Ivan Engebretson from the University of Oslo uh, for what I've called inspiring conversations. It's actually a bit more than that. I've co-authored uh, academic papers and grant applications with them, and I've learned a lot from them, but I'm still very much an intellectual novice uh, in the philosophy of pragmatism. My uh, area of expertise is uh, in, for, for the purposes of this talk, public health um, policy analysis. Uh, so I'm, first of all, I'd say responsibilities for any philosophical errors is mine alone, but also I know we've got some pretty clever philosophers in the audience. So I'm genuinely looking forward to uh, a good discussion uh, from uh, experts in philosophy. But let me start off by unpacking the term crisis. Now, in their book, The Politics of Crisis Management, which was published in 2016, Arjun Bowen and his colleagues defined a crisis as a situation that is unusual, volatile, and potentially far-reaching in its negative implications, and as characterized by threat, uncertainty, and urgency. Uh, and these authors propose five strategic leadership tasks in any crisis, using real-time data to work out what's happening, decision-making and coordinating, constructing a meaningful account of what's happening, managing accountability, and finally, learning from the crisis. And I'm going to return to this slide towards the end of my, my talk uh, to uh, bring back some of the things I, I'm now going to present to you and see how they apply to those leadership tasks. So Bowen et al's book, which was of course published before the pandemic, was spot on in some of its predictions. They predicted how government leaders would be forced to contemplate measures that had rarely, if ever, uh, been imposed in peacetime, such as closing schools, closing businesses, radically restricting civil liberties. Measures which included what they call tragic choices, with significant downsides as well as potential but unproven benefits. Now, it's obviously important not to make too many sweeping statements, but I would suggest that the UK's disastrous performance in some aspects of the pandemic has revealed entrenched flaws in the policymaking process. Poor decisions, ineffective interventions, waste of resources, bitter squabbles, erosion of trust and widespread loss of life have resulted. Now, conventional policy analysts depict policymaking as a rather rational and somewhat technical process which uses empirical data, mostly quantitative data, uh, to generate authoritative knowledge about what works. And this whole approach assumes that policy decisions can be directly based on the knowledge that's generated. And we all know that slogan, following the science. I've actually got a, a PhD student who's, whose thesis is entitled following the science with a question mark. Um, now for critical policy scholars, such as Deborah Stone, policymaking is not a rational process of applying evidence to solve self-evident problems. Rather, according to these policy analysts, it's a contact sport between ideas, including ideas about what the problems are and how they might be addressed, institutions, notably government and, and the machinery of the state, and interests, whether financial or non-financial, whether short or long term. Now, this depiction of policymaking emphasizes that it is an interpretive, a discursive and conflict-ridden process. It's about framing a problem, negotiating its meaning, arguing for one or other solution, uh, using techniques like storytelling, rhetoric, and enacted drama. 
So here's some more critical policy analysts, Hayer and Wagner, you may be familiar with them. Um, they depict the policy environment uh, as increasingly decentered, multifaceted, unpredictable, and to a large extent, unknowable. And it's that unknowability I'm going to come back to. Quantitative policy analysts can make only a limited contribution to this kind of environment. The modern world, they say, is characterized by a proliferation of new sites of policymaking, increased cultural pluralism, an interconnectedness and interdependence among various cultural groups, radical uncertainty and limits to knowledge as a result of this pluralism and lack of trust in policymakers. The policymaking context, I think we all know, has become further complicated by radical transformations of the digital world, um, which uh, create and generate and distribute uh, these alternative facts of the post-truth era. So the disconnect between dominant positivist and technocratic forms of policy analysis and the actual content of policy decision-making has never been starker. Now, during the pandemic, during the pandemic, the science policy relationship has had to grapple with a lot of uncertainty. For a few policy questions, definitive scientific knowledge existed somewhere, but it failed to surface in the right place at the right time and in the right format to feed into key deliberations. But for many questions, definitive scientific knowledge didn't even exist. In both these situations, I think, scientists and policymakers colluded, consciously or unconsciously, to deny the prevailing uncertainty and present an overly definitive version of science, which policymakers could then insist that they were following. Now, the very notion of scientific uncertainty sits very uncomfortably in an empiricist world where there's considered to be a stable, generalizable and ascertainable truth towards which scientific inquiry progresses, using terms like certainty, confidence, precision, data-driven, and last but not least, evidence-based. Scientific uncertainty is typically expressed in terms of known unknowns, for example, about the virus's transmissibility and incubation period, and the impact of particular drugs on its natural history, with the implication that once these well-defined knowledge gaps are filled with generalizable truths, certainty will prevail. Inhabitants of this empiricist world may not accept, indeed they may not even understand, the philosophical argument that theory is always underdetermined by data. Nor may empiricists accept that policy uncertainties relate not merely to gaps in our scientific understanding, but to a host of other things, such as resources, practicalities of implementation, or political acceptability. Uncertainty is laid bare in times of crisis when the precise abstract truths beloved of quantitative policy analysts prove elusive. At such times, policy narratives unfold rapidly in real time. They tend to be dramatic, image rich, and suffused with risk and suspense. In such circumstances, an emergent approach is needed with improvisation and muddling through, tasks that are particularly difficult when the uncertainties are unknown unknowns. Narrative deliberation, the weighing up of competing stories is particularly crucial at such times. Now, Herodimus Soukas points out in this paper that in traditional societies, knowledge was closely tied to individuals and localities embodied in practical experience and embedded in contexts. In many contemporary spheres, quantitative policy analysis being a case in point, knowledge has become reduced to abstracted, decontextualized, and usually numerical information that is easily stored and exchanged. 
but which fails to capture the know-how of experienced frontline practitioners or the contexts that are critical to their work. Such information increasingly comes to stand for real phenomena. For example, R, the reproduction number, has become a kind of blunt shorthand for the progress or regress of the pandemic. But because the information has been decontextualized, we don't know where it came from, who produced it, in what circumstances, for what audience, or for what purpose. Hence, we don't really know what it means, and we can't trust it. Because of this, and because there's so much of it in so many different forms, information fails to enlighten us. Rather, multiple interpretations and versions of the truth, each produced by a different interest group with a different frame of reference, begin to circulate. The result is typically confusion and conflict. Furthermore, because decontextualized information is not the accurate mirror of reality it's assumed to be, policies that are exclusively data-driven, in inverted commas, but which miss the nuances of a complex social reality can backfire badly. In the UK, the pandemic was associated with a mission critical loss of trust at multiple levels. Policymakers distrusted scientific advice. Citizens came to distrust their elected leaders. Leaders in turn distrusted citizens shifting from deliberative to more impositional forms of government. And interest groups of various kinds developed a deep distrust of one another. Rather than coming together to reflect and deliberate, expert and lay interest groups alike tended to polarize into camps and then lock horns. Now to illustrate the points I've been making, I want to look at a couple of examples, mask mandates and vaccination of children, uh, and I see that Stephen John's going to be talking about masks tomorrow, so I'm only going to have a couple of slides on it. I won't steal his thunder, uh, but it was uh, a topic that, that illustrates some of the examples, uh, some of the theoretical points uh, I've been making. So, in relation to masks, deep divisions emerged early in the pandemic between advocates of the precautionary principle who argued that masks might work and are unlikely to harm, so they should be introduced as soon as possible, especially since indirect evidence suggested they could have a large impact on transmission, and those who espoused the so-called evidence-based masking policies, arguing that pending definitive scientific evidence, masks should not be recommended and certainly not mandated. Policymakers in most Western countries, along with the World Health Organization, initially took the latter view, but came to align with the former. Now, at the root of one of the pandemic's most entrenched expert standoffs were philosophical questions about the value we should place on different kinds of evidence. In particular, the extent to which randomized controlled trials or lack of them could trump the sum total of real world case studies and mechanistic evidence, and also political questions about whose evidence can be made to count. Now, Crystal Lee and her colleagues extended the mask debate by considering how, and I quote, controversial understandings of the coronavirus pandemic turned data visualizations into a battleground. These authors used online ethnography to explore how Evidence was generated, visualized, and shared among anti-establishment and anti-mask online communities. Members of these communities were often highly skilled in data visualization. They shared a deep suspicion of authorities and elites. Working in decentralized online networks, they deconstructed and rejected official charts and graphics and generated their own alternatives from publicly available raw data. They viewed these alternatives as more accurate because they were allegedly free of the, quote, biases, unquote, of formal institutions, an approach which resonated with their libertarian values, such as don't be a sheep and do your own research. Now, Crystal Lee and her colleagues warn that those who dismiss such work as fake news are missing the point 
the novel visualizations were derived from genuine measurements and their creators were highly numerate. Their efforts were a sophisticated epistemological slate of hand in which they, they carefully selected fragments of decontextualized data to refract the story of the crisis through seemingly objective numbers and images. Countering such misunderstandings requires more than the presentation of more decontextualized data, since their radically different starting points lead pro and anti mask groups to draw drastically different inferences from similar data. There can be no productive dialogue between two communities when there are such fundamental differences in what Wittgenstein would have called the forms of life they inhabit and enact and in the meanings they attach to phenomena. My second example is child vaccination. The UK's official policy advisory group, the Joint Committee on Vaccination and Immunization, JCVI, announced in July 2021 that vaccines should not be offered routinely to 12 to 17 year olds because the health benefits of vaccination did not, in their view, outweigh the potential risks. The UK's Royal College of Pediatricians and Child Health agreed with them. But in a very public clash with its own scientific advisors, the UK government overruled JCBI and recommended urgent vaccination of teenagers in September 2021. The US Centers for Disease Control and Prevention interpreted the same scientific evidence very differently to JCBI and declared that the benefits of vaccination clearly outweighed the risks in children. Now, these groups drew opposite conclusions because they deemed certain facts to be in frame or out of frame, or because they placed different value on these facts. JCVI was criticized, for example, for defining the adverse effects of COVID-19 entirely in terms of hospitalizations and death, both rare, and failing to factor in other important negatives, such as missed school days, impact on mental health, and long COVID. JCVI was also accused of overestimating the risks of myocarditis with vaccination and underestimating the risk of a more serious form of myocarditis from COVID itself. So as UK schools returned from the summer break, politicians came under pressure from parents who were anxious to protect their children against COVID-19, though some libertarian parents took the opposite view. Politicians also talked about the need to solidify our wall of protection, that is protect the population against a virus that could potentially evolve to escape vaccine immunity. The goal of protecting the population was explicit in child vaccination policies in some other countries. In Malta, for example, the decision to vaccinate young people was shaped among other factors by the close knit family structures in a country where adolescents often have frequent contact with their grandparents. But the UK's Royal College of Pediatrician and Child Health, along with JCBI, had focused more narrowly on the question of risks versus benefits to the individual child. So in sum, once again, the deep divisions between these groups were mostly explained by their different worldviews and how they framed the issue. These examples illustrate how the expectation that science will deliver definitive and more or less generalizable knowledge tends to produce policy inertia rather than prompt action. A key scientific maxim in medicine is do not act until certainty is achieved. And that is entirely appropriate when applied, for example, to a new and powerful drug that hasn't yet been tested and whose side effects could conceivably prove worse than the disease. It is inappropriate in an escalating pandemic when inaction could bring catastrophic consequences. The UK government came to regret its early policy of not acting until it had certainty. As the then Secretary of State for Health and Social Care, Matt Hancock told an official inquiry, I was in a situation of not having hard evidence that a global scientific consensus of decades was wrong, but having an instinct that it was. I bitterly regret that I didn't overrule that scientific advice at the start and say that we should proceed on the basis that there is asymptomatic transmission 
until we know that there is not, rather than the other way round. These heartfelt regrets beg the question of why in countries where the pandemic wreaked most havoc, the precautionary principle had been, as Andrew Nikiforuk so aptly put it, abandoned like an orphan on the Silk Road by scientists as well as policymakers. It also raises the question of how policymaking might be enabled to make wise and timely decisions in an unfolding crisis, even as uncertainty prevails. So let me sum up what I think we can learn from these brief examples. I think they show that the government and public health authorities failed to grasp the essential nature of crisis, namely inherent uncertainty and the need to make urgent decisions to avert a major threat. They approached policymaking as a logical endeavor grounded in scientific rationality. They assumed that uncertainty was temporary and would be eliminated by science, hence that certainty should come first, followed by action. They conflated knowledge with abstracted, decontextualized, and usually quantitative information, such as the reproduction number or the effect size of interventions. And they communicated with the public, chiefly by declarations of false certainty. Now let's come to pragmatism, see how it might help us. Many of you will know that this branch of philosophy originated in the United States in the late 19th century with names like Charles Sanders Pierce, William James, George Herbert Mead, Jane Addams, John Dewey. There are many detailed accounts of its philosophical basis and core principles. I'd recommend the work of Cheryl Missack. That's because I work with her. Um, I sort of put some of her books here. She's not paying me to, to give her this um, advertising. Um, but, but this is how I got into pragmatism was, was I picked up one of her books a, a few months ago. Actually, my favorite pragmatist is a woman, Jane Addams, who, as well as being a social reformer, was also a pragmatist philosopher. She set up a hostel for the poor of Chicago. She undertook participatory research with rather than on the residents of the hostel. She published the findings in academic journals and she won the Nobel Peace Prize. So not a bad uh, track record there. But I'm going to draw uh, with the author's permission on a more recent paper by Catherine Berenger, who's a social work academic, who's offered five defining features of pragmatism, which I think work well as sensitizing concepts for exploring how this particular philosophy might be applied uh, in a crisis healthcare context. So the first principle is that science is fallible. Pierce, the founder of pragmatism, argued that empirical observations can never establish the truth of a scientific theory with certainty. Theories are always underdetermined by available facts, and facts can be explained by more than one theory. Rather, rather than relying entirely on induction, that is drawing conclusions from observations, the, the white swan argument or the black swan argument, or deduction, making logical inferences from premises that are assumed to be true, we must also use abduction. That is, we form a working provisional hypothesis and we keep modifying it in the light of new observations. The notion that we can never achieve certainty, so must learn to work with uncertainty using abduction reframes science as an iterative process of hypothesis testing in the real world. Secondly, ideas and action are inseparable. The pragmatic maxim, said Pierce, requires our beliefs, our theories and concepts to be directly and reflexively linked to experience, practice, expectations and consequences. The value of an idea or a claim depends on its practical application. Indeed, Pierce defined a belief as something on which one is prepared to act. Instrumentalism, as the pragmatists call it, use knowing, such as research, and doing, such as social reform, health improvement, crisis policymaking, as inseparable. Truth is therefore to be found not in the quest for generalities and abstractions, but in natural and practical experiments. Thirdly, we need to look at problems in multiple ways. Pragmatism encourages us to use multiple scientific approaches, including basic science, qualitative research, computer models, natural experiments, as well as randomized trials, 
and bring multiple ethical perspectives, including theories of duty, utility, and virtue to bear on real world challenges. The right research design and, and the right moral theories will become salient by engaging with the concrete detail of a real world situation, informed by the pragmatist's abductive speculation. What could this be? And how might this best be studied and addressed? John Dewey observed that the need for pluralism is particularly acute if the real world situation is complex, fast changing and risky. Fourthly, humans create shared symbolic meanings. Humans are social beings who create and exchange cultural symbols. Pierce proposed that a sign's meaning is due not to its intrinsic qualities, but to the effect it has on the person interpreting it. An understanding of how people interpret the world can inform how we engage them as partners in change and how we go beyond terms like objective and subjective to achieve the intersubjective understandings that are needed for effective collective action. As the masking example illustrates, the pandemic showed how toxic deadlock can occur in the absence of these intersubjective understandings. And finally, we need to build solutions with communities. Uh, pragmatists use this term experimentalism, and by that they mean systematic testing in the real world. Make a change based on the best information you have, then carefully observe what happens and adapt in the light of emerging data. Crucial to the link between research and participatory democracy is the need to educate citizens, especially the marginalized and oppressed, and help them develop the skills and attitudes of critical thinking in both senses, critical appraisal of scientific evidence, but also critical awareness where relevant of their own oppression. Now, pragmatist ideas have been emerging in a number of applied health subfields in recent years. For example, action research, community-based participatory research, some forms of mixed method research, uh, some people would claim pragmatic randomized controlled trials, climate change research, utilization focused evaluation, and various iterations of patient and public involvement, public engagement. I've put in in pandemic public health policy making as a bit of wishful thinking there. Uh, I'm not sure there's been much pragmatism there, but certainly I think it, it, it fits theoretically. Indeed, that's uh, what I'm spending this lecture arguing to you. Um, now, to a greater or lesser extent in each of these methodologies, the term pragmatic is used uh, to depict three broadly pragmatist features. Firstly, undertaken naturalistically in the real world. Secondly, designed and executed in partnership with patients and citizens. Uh, and thirdly, oriented to producing something socially useful, especially for underserved groups. Now, many designs in health services research which claim pragmatist roots have been criticized for cherry picking concepts from pragmatist philosophy while ignoring its foundational elements. They are, say the critics, ontologically weak because they place no emphasis on the unity of knower and known. They're epistemologically weak because they fail to emphasize how knowledge is created through action. They're axiologically weak uh, because they pay lip service to social justice while pursuing inquiry in more or less conventional ways. In other words, researcher-centered ways. They may be methodologically weak because they're designed to build knowledge deductively and inductively while overlooking the crucial role of abductive reasoning. They may fail to acknowledge the key role of shared cultural meanings and symbolic interactionism, uh, and they favor design as method over design as inquiry. And what I mean by that is when co-designing solutions uh, with communities, the focus is on rather technocratic questions like whether we should do qualitative research first and then move on to quantitative or vice versa. Whereas actually the key questions are design as inquiry questions such as what exactly is the problem? Who should be invited to the planning table? And whose interests will the research serve? 
So in short, whilst pragmatic forms of research and knowledge translation are now ubiquitous, these approaches often seem to have come adrift from their espoused philosophical roots. So now let me return to one of my earlier slides. Policy making in pandemics, to take one kind of crisis, involves various difficult tasks which must be coordinated rapidly in a changing context. Data must be generated to capture the pandemic's progress and the impact of efforts to contain it. And such data will always be incomplete and contested since whilst, as we heard earlier on today, real-time data modeling is now a sophisticated science, there remains, to quote one modeling critic, uncertainty within models, across models and about models. Nevertheless, hard and sometimes tragic choices must be made and followed through to implementation. This requires engagement with the realities and meaning systems of different stakeholder groups and bringing these groups together to deliberate on what exactly the problem is and how it should be addressed. In pandemic research may be needed to generate new data, though the temptation to try to eliminate uncertainty must be tempered by the knowledge that science is fallible and policy must recognize the social and political context within which science is commissioned and takes place. A nuanced story must be crafted and conveyed to stakeholders and the public about what is happening and why it matters. This narrative must make values explicit and present leaders as trustworthy and possessing integrity, competence and credibility. Leaders must take responsibility for how events have unfolded, including the unintended consequences of failed policies. Finally, lessons must be learned and the system improved to make it more resilient and fit for purpose to cope with the next pandemic. Now, I think that all these activities could be optimized using the pandemic, using the pragmatist principles I've described earlier. I believe that there is merit in further research to strengthen the evidence base on crisis policymaking uh, using pragmatic, pra pragmatist principles. So firstly, from scientism to science-informed narrative rationality, and I'm using some words uh, from Fisher here, who criticized science for claiming to pronounce a story that ends all storytelling, when in reality, science is only one component of what he calls narrative rationality. Uh, and by narrative rationality, he means good reason, including consideration of values. Uh, and we use narrative rationality to decide whose story is the most coherent and reliable as a guide to belief and action. More recently, the growing complexities in the policy environment have prompted a call to remove what Haya and Wagner have called a positivistic firewall between science and political decision-making. Instead, they suggest we should try to improve the fit between science and policy by focusing our attention on the concrete everyday activities of citizens, politicians, and administrators, where whatever knowledge we possess must be assessed for its relevance and usefulness in interaction with the concrete situation at hand. These authors recommend a pragmatist approach to policy analysis built on the three pillar, pillars of interpretation, practice orientation, and deliberation. Secondly, we need research to take us from knowledge then action to knowledge through action. Conventional models of knowledge translation assume that science can be produced in the realm of generalities and then translated across countries and localities to solve multiple real world policy problems. Such models dis distinguish between knowledge production and knowledge translation as activities that are separated in time with knowledge first being produced and then translated. Pragmatism emphatically rejects the idea that the world is given to us through a set of discrete scientific events and objects, since these are merely secondary abstractions from the infinite richness of lived experience. Through a pragmatist lens then, knowledge translation is a concocted scientific solution to what Dewey called self-set problems. 
Now, Western colleagues who applied pragmatist scholarship to climate change research have proposed a model called evolutionary learning for linking research, policymaking, and action in complex, fast moving situations. They emphasize three guiding principles the need to be problem oriented and embed all activities in the policy and decision making context, the need to establish structures and processes that enable reflexivity so as to identify possibilities and constraints. And finally, the need to create spaces for deliberation that bring values, historical processes of change and future possibilities into the frame. Thirdly, we need research into how to move from hierarchies of evidence to epistemological pluralism. Pragmatism teaches us that unless we carefully consider all the evidence and all perspectives, our deliberations could take us further away from the truth instead of closer to it. But as illustrated by the standoff around masks, this principle is thwarted by the overuse of evidence hierarchies to devalue and dismiss forms of evidence which do not meet a narrow set of methodological criteria. Evidence hierarchies such as GRADE have a respectable provenance within clinical epidemiology, but in recent years, they've come to be used excessively, naively, and in increasingly politicized ways. Such hierarchies are used by journal editors, reviewers, and grant giving panels, usually in well-intentioned efforts to maintain scientific quality as a substitute for deeper engagement with quality of scholarship. The effect of such hierarchies is to restrict the range and diversity of evidence that is generated, published, acknowledged as good research and fed into policy. Fourthly, we need research on how to move from polarized camps to frame reflective deliberation. So building on the pragmatist notion of symbolic interactionism is the theoretical work of Schoen and Rhein on frame reflective discourse. Considering different frames can expose the assumptions, meanings, values, preferences, and ideological positions from which stakeholders argue. The more aware we are of the different framings being brought to the discussion by others, the better we will understand the multifaceted nature of policy problems. Frame awareness opens up possibilities for developing alternative framings, constructing arguments which take account of other parties' points of departure, and thinking collaboratively and creatively about complex problems. This task requires moral engagement, since, as the example of masks and child vaccination illustrate, policy choices are not neutral decisions, but social, moral, and political acts, which have deep symbolic meaning and may bring consequences for social justice. Frame awareness helps explain why, during the pandemic, different modeling groups, drawn from different disciplines and sectors, provided different forecasts and projections about the disease's evolution or its socioeconomic consequences. This wasn't because one group's model was correct and another's incorrect, rather the assumptions and prior conditions being fed into different models produced in mathematical form multiple perspectives on the pandemic whose comparative relevance to a particular policy question then had to be deliberated. Finally, we need research on how to move from inside track influence to participatory democracy. In an article on storytelling in policymaking, Davidson distinguishes the narratives that come from inside track relationships between scientists and policymakers, for example, through their advisory committees, uh, from the outside track narrative, narratives which tend to be more confrontational and emerge through non-mainstream scientists, pressure groups, and the media. Pragmatist principles support consulting as broad a range of expertise and opinion as possible from both other scientific disciplines and the wider public, and using the deliberative process to select the most salient and plausible accounts and mobilize action around those. Such a process must, of course, be democratic, not tokenistic. So I'm going to finish with a sort of starter for 10 on a research agenda 
for crisis policy making. And, and these are the five questions I think uh, we could do with a bit more research on how can policy bodies move beyond scientism uh, in which they commission advice on what works and then follow it. And you can see I've put those in inverted commas. Secondly, what structures, systems and tools could help policymakers move from linear models to a knowledge through action approach? Thirdly, how can the distorting influence of evidence hierarchies and technocratic approaches to assessing evidence be overcome? And that third question is the one I, I, I lie awake at night and worry about, to be honest. Fourthly, how can frame awareness be applied to increase mutual understanding and reduce polarization as values and ideologies are brought to bear on policy debates? And finally, how can we ensure that deliberation on urgent policy decisions go beyond a narrow inside track group of favored advisors? So in conclusion, I've argued that a key element of policymaking in times of crisis is the need to make urgent and wise decisions in the absence of certainty. I'm gonna give the last word to Jane Adams, who said pragmatism must be grounded in a philosophy whose foundation is on the solidarity of the human race. Its residents must be emptied of all conceit of opinion and all self-assertion uh, and be ready to, um, to arouse and interpret the public opinion of their neighborhood. And I think the challenge now uh, for us is to apply that neighborhood pragmatism uh, on a global scale with a, with a global vision. Um, and I would love to hear your thoughts on how we might go about that. So thank you for listening. I'll now stop sharing so we can see each other.